This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Hi everybody, I'm Dr. David Granite, and welcome to Health Matters. All of us do it. It takes up maybe a third of our day. What am I talking about? Sleep. But not all the time does sleep go well. And why do we need sleep? And what happens when it doesn't go well? For this really important topic, that's a third of your life, we have with us Dr. Robert Owens. Welcome. Thank you. Dr. Owens is board certified in pulmonary uh, critical care and sleep medicine. Mm -hmm. Got it right. I want to make Correct. sure I got all this right. Yep. Uh, uh, spent a lot of your life in Boston, and as a New Yorker, I can't even talk about those institutions. <laughs> but I, but you were at Columbia Medical School, so Correct. I can talk about a New York place. Okay. Uh, and my son's at Columbia right now as oh, an undergraduate student. Thank you. And um, we would normally consider some of the best places, and now you're at the best place here at UC San Diego. Right. Um, and, and I said it. I mean, really, we spend a third of our lives sleeping, roughly. Uh, it, it's such an important thing, but it's not just a word, sleep, and, and it's not just closing your eyes and then waking up. So much takes place. So I wanted to start there before we get any further, because we're gonna talk about sleep apnea as our, as our major issue here. Sure. What is sleep? Uh, that is a great question, and I think you're right that we're learning more and more about what actually is sleep. And you're right, it's not just that you close your eyes and eight hours later you wake up. There's a lot that's going on. And we used to think of sleep as a restful time for your body, and for many organs it is, but there's a lot going on in your brain, in your immune system, and in other parts of your body that's very active, and a lot of important things are happening. And we're well, just getting to understand that. So you said a restful time, but your, um, your lungs are still working. Mm -hmm. your, your brain has still got lots of activity that's going on. Right. Um, your eyes are moving. Uh, your, your other organs are still filtering and doing all the things that they have to do. Mm -hmm. What's actually resting? Well, I think that your muscles are resting, lungs may be resting, uh, and heart and blood pressure, and we'll talk about when we get to sleep apnea. Those are things like heart rate and blood pressure. Those should go down while you sleep. But you're absolutely right. Your brain is still on and really active. And when we hook people up in the sleep lab, we see you know, when you're dreaming, you're probably doing a whole lot of important things there that we don't fully understand yet. So many organs are resting, um, but some are still going kind of full bore. And, and you led me perfectly to what I wanted to ask you next is, why on earth do we sleep? I, you know, I, I sort of had a thought that you might ask that because <laughs> if, if I knew that, I don't think I'd be here. I'd, you know, go to Stockholm, get, get my the Nobel, Nobel Prize. Prize you know? <laughs> um, but nobody really knows. And uh, people have come up with all sorts of kind of interesting hypotheses. You know, maybe it's nature's way of protecting us. So caveman, you know, shouldn't be out at night because he'll, he's going to fall off a cliff or get attacked by a saber-toothed tiger. So maybe you should be laying down in your cave and out of danger. Um, so we don't really know why people sleep, but we're learning a lot about why sleep is important, and that might give us some clues. So you know, I think people are recognizing now that when you sleep, you, uh, that has important effects on memory. So if I give you a piece of paper with, let's say, 10 things that you should memorize, how well you sleep tonight will predict how well you can tell me what those 10 items are tomorrow. And that's, so, that's the single most important factor. And that's fascinating because I'm thinking of the, the kid in college who yep. stays up really late studying for a test. Uh, and they might be better off getting a good night's sleep. Absolutely. And so, you know, this is data from uh, a doctor named Bob Stickold who's in Boston. And uh, I know a town that you may not like, but yeah, there's some good stuff that's it. come out of there. And he looked at organic chemistry students. So these are students desperate to get into medical school for whatever reason. Memorizing a large body of information. Correct. And he looked at how much they slept in a week before their exam. And how you sleep the night before the test uh, is inversely related to how well you do on the test. So the, least, you know, the less sleep you get the night before, kind of the worse you do. And the best thing to do is to really get 
uh, sort of a little amount of sleep throughout the whole week because that means you're probably studying every night a little bit and you are getting some rest. But if you try and cram the night before, it's not going to go The wrong well. way to go. Yeah. Um, and, and so this leads us to, I said a third of our lives we spend sleeping and I mm -hmm. was roughing it out. How much sleep do we need and does that change throughout our lives? Well, again, I think that uh, it's increasingly recognized that you really do need about eight hours of sleep. So your mother was right. You know, you do need that much sleep. And depending on if you want to be tip-top performance, you may need closer to nine hours of sleep. And so you'll meet people who say, I only need six hours of sleep. And maybe those people exist, but if they do, they're really rare, like one in a million. And otherwise, they're getting by using what you and I get by with, which is coffee or other, you know, stimulants. <laughs> yeah. um, this is water, by yeah, the way. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. But, um, but no, you probably do need eight hours of sleep. And we were talking a little bit about sleep and learning, but sleep is important for things like your immune system. And so if you ask people how much they sleep, and people that only get six hours of sleep, they're more likely to get pneumonia, you know, going forward than people who get eight hours of sleep. Uh, and if you look at people uh, and ask them how much sleep do you get and then look to see how many heart attacks they have down the road, people who sleep only six hours a night get more heart attacks than people who sleep eight hours per night. My teen sons keep Googling information that tells me that teenagers need to sleep more and get up later and school should start later. That's correct. And so this changes throughout your life. Yeah, it, it's, it's not totally worked out how much sleep you need, although there are changes in the kinds of sleep. There are different kinds of stages of sleep at night. But in particular, around the teenage years, you know, late teenage years, early 20s, the time that you want to go to sleep and the time that you want to get up do shift later. And so... Um, do schools need to respond to that? It, it's very possible. You know, the, uh, the best researcher on this is an, if you Google Owens and sleep, my name doesn't come up, but Judith Owens, who's uh, in Washington, D.C., is a big proponent of this, and she's done a lot of work on this. And there are many kids who are sleeping through the first couple periods of the day. Uh, and what would make the most sense is basically getting middle schoolers to school on time at 7 o'clock and then having the uh, high schoolers come back at, you know, maybe 9 o'clock. Wow. And, and people would have more effective first periods of class. They learn more. They would, you know, do better on tests. So, okay, we get, we sleep. Yep. We get, there's a time chunk we need to sleep and we get important things are happening while we sleep. Now we need to talk about what can go wrong. Mm -hmm. So why do people have trouble sleeping? What are the categories of things that get you into trouble sleeping? Well, I think that there's a number of things that can happen. My specialty, uh, based on my pulmonary background, is really people who have trouble breathing and sleeping at the same time. So we can talk about sleep apnea. But I think the most common difficulty that people have with sleep is actually not getting enough of it. So <laughs> I, th I think, you know, we're talking a little bit about it, but it really deserves mentioning again that the number one cause of sleepiness in the country is not getting enough sleep. So. Yeah, and, and we live in a, in a world where it, it seems like you just have so much to do. Right. Uh, and so we have to turn those things off. But um, trouble getting to sleep is different than trouble once you're asleep. Right. So once you have somebody who has made enough time to get sleep, they've put their iPhone down or whatever, now when they're having trouble sleeping, that's what we call insomnia. And so insomnia is very common and many Americans are affected by insomnia. And when I say insomnia, I mean three different things. It's either trouble falling asleep, trouble staying asleep, or feeling that your sleep is not refreshing enough. Okay, and, and so shifting over to this word called sleep apnea, mm -hmm. um, and, and I, I know that if you, if you drink before you go to sleep, that can mess up your sleep. There's all sorts of things can happen, but mm -hmm. typical sleep, somebody gets sleep apnea, that can affect um, sleepiness as well as the quality of their sleep. Correct. And health, all sorts of health things. So we probably need to talk about what is sleep apnea and how do we define that? What, what, is the, what are those words? Well, sleep apnea means that there's a pause in breathing during the time that you're asleep. And there's two main categories of sleep apnea. And there's something called obstructive sleep apnea and then there's central sleep apnea. And just most people, if they've ever heard the term sleep apnea, it's, it's the obstructive sleep apnea. That's much more common. But, and that's mostly what I'll focus on. But obstructive sleep apnea means that patients trying to breathe air in and out of their, their mouth or nose, but somewhere along the way here, there's a blockage. Maybe the tongue has gone back into the airway. Now the subject or the patient's trying to breathe, but no air is going in or out. And, and that can lead to problems, as you said, because eventually patient needs to wake themselves up. And when they wake themselves up to move their tongue forward, um, get air back into their lungs, then that interrupts with the quality of sleep. And, and do they wake up with uh, this weird feeling of having been hypoxic, choked, or something? I mean. It 
Not necessarily. So we see patients all the time who uh, report, you know, I'm coming to see you because I do feel like I'm waking up choking or short of breath. We get a lot of people who come in because they say, my wife says I stop breathing, but they feel that they have no sleep problem at all. So if you're sleeping alone and, and you're having some of these, you might not have any idea Correct. that you have sleep apnea, except the fact that you are tired or you have some health issues that might connect back? Yes, you know, there are many uh, characteristics of people that have sleep apnea. Um, and so it's a very common disease in men. It's very common as men get older, um, also correlated with weight. So as people's weight goes up, it's more common. But the symptoms that people have can be not feeling refreshed in the morning, uh, feeling tired throughout the day, dry mouth, um, headaches in the morning. These are all signs that you might have sleep apnea. So, I, I mean, if we took all the people that had some of those signs that you just described, right. you would have every American coming to you. <laughs> yeah. You know, given the lack of sleep that we all get and all that. Um, it, what, somebody's sitting in their house right now, mm -hmm. um, and, and they're wondering whether or not they might have sleep apnea. Right. What do they do? Well, the, the best thing, if you do have a sleep partner, someone that's seen you sleep, and this could be someone who, you know, spouse who's in your bed with you, or we have a lot of guys who say, I went on a fishing trip and my buddies wouldn't sleep in the same cabin with me. So find out some parallel history if you can, whether that's snoring, and many people snore who don't have sleep apnea. But if someone says, I watched you sleep last night, and I was worried you weren't gonna start breathing again, or you know, I heard a long pause, that's pretty suggestive that you do have sleep apnea, and you should come and see us. And you know, once people come to our clinic, then we do do uh, an evaluation and some sleep testing to try and figure out who actually has sleep apnea or not. What kind of numbers of Americans are we talking about have sleep apnea? This is a, a really important question. And uh, if you looked in 1993 or so, okay, that's the last year that we have really good data on this. Uh, it was about 4% of American men and 2% of women. But there's good reasons to think those numbers are way too low now. And the number one reason is because America has gotten a lot larger, okay? Or Americans have gotten yes. a lot larger. So it's been estimated that about 15% of American men have sleep apnea, and women it's probably about 10%. These are middle-aged Americans. I mean, that, that's a lot of people. You're talking about 50 million people? Correct. Uh, you know, that, that's an enormous number of people who are impacted by this. Absolutely. So, you know, we have had trouble, there are not that many, there are not, uh, you know, a million sleep physicians to take care of all these people or, you know, even a hundred thousand sleep physicians to do that. So we've really uh, had to try and get the word out, do a lot of education about this. I think that if, when I see patients in my clinic, I say, well, anyone in the family have sleep apnea? And everyone says, well, my dad or my mom snored really loudly and was tired all the time. We just didn't know it was called sleep apnea. So we're, people are more cognizant of it. Um, we're also doing a lot with technology, doing more home sleep testing, which I think makes it feasible to find out who has sleep apnea or not. So l let's talk about the consequences. We've got sleepiness, I understand that. Yeah. Are there other medical consequences to sleep apnea? I do wanna go back to the, the sleepiness comment. So there's sort of two broad categories of consequences, and there's the neurocognitive, which is kind of the sleepiness, but there's a little bit more than that. People don't do as well at work, um, people are kind of irritable, so interpersonal relationships are not as good. Um, car accidents, people with sleep apnea uh -huh. get more car accidents. And if you are a golfer, if you have sleep apnea and you get treated, your handicap gets a little bit better. So, you know, it's performance oh, on many things. Oh, you've got everybody. Yeah. <laughs> so that's for the men here, yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, so you can lower your handicap if you get right. your sleep apnea. Right, it'll there make it you is. better that's looking. That's the headline. Yeah, and that was the headline for that particular study which came out a couple years ago. Uh, you can imagine, yeah. right. Um, so it does have, so we talk about sleepiness, but sleepiness is maybe hard to kind of describe, and there are other more concrete things that- Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because I think um, I hadn't even thought about the moodiness and the the impact on interpersonal relationships right. and your performance at work, et cetera, those, those, are, those are really crucial things in yeah. people's lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So the other thing that we focus on, though, are the consequences that, are, that accrue to the cardiovascular system, and I, I think that's where you were maybe asking about, but people with sleep apnea are at increased risk for high blood pressure, heart attacks, stroke, and different kinds of heart arrhythmias like atrial fibrillation. So all the kinds of things that you don't want to have happen uh, you know, sleep apnea puts you at an increased risk for those things. And if sleep apnea is treated, does that risk go down? It does appear to be that, that the risk goes down with successful treatment. So are there, uh, you, you've got the test, you put somebody in a sleep lab. Are there Sometimes. Other, there are the other testing that you put people through as you're diagnosing them before we get to treatment? Yes, so the traditional way that sleep apnea was uh, diagnosed is that people would come into a facility, 
They would be hooked up to about 25 different sensors, and a t sleep technician would monitor them during their sleep and sometimes record it. I've always wondered about that. It yeah. seems to me like it's hard to fall asleep in that setting. We recognize that that's not how you normally sleep at home. So many people are nervous about falling asleep in the sleep lab, and generally it turns out okay. Good. We don't need eight hours worth of sleep, even with a couple hours of sleep. You get the data. We get the data. But the newer thing, so it's not newest because it's been out for five or ten years or so, is now doing testing in the home. So we have a device that we can give to people and they put it on themselves at night before they go to sleep. Very simple, band around the chest, that lets us know when you're breathing in or out, oxygen probe on the finger, and then basically a, a cannula or a plastic tube in the nose and that measures the airflow. And you put it on and uh, you bring it back to us the next day. Well, heck, that's a lot easier. Yeah. So, you know, patients really like that. Um, it's much more convenient. It's probably much more like they're normally sleeping at home, which is really helpful. So um, there are downsides to that kind of test. For example, we call it a home sleep test, but I can't tell if somebody's sleeping or not. It's really just to look at their breathing. But for most people, when we're just thinking about sleep apnea, it's, it's a good test. So now we've, we've got somebody who's um, maybe been impaired somewhat by the mm -hmm. sleep apnea through the sleepiness things we just talked about. They have some of the, maybe the physical things. They come to you or they come to their primary care physician and somebody suspects this. They get them, start to get worked up. Now what do you do? Okay, we diagnosed it. They've got sleep apnea. What do you do? Well, I think the first thing we do is we provide education. I mean, people may have heard a little bit about sleep apnea, but they don't know how important it is. And so like any medical treatment, you need to provide some education about why it's important to do this. So it the, improves, improves compliance. There's so many positive things to doing that. Yeah, and there's also, you know, we're going to talk about different devices to treat sleep apnea, but there are many things that patients can do themselves that don't involve any devices to make their sleep apnea better. Like what? So, you know, we mentioned that weight is a risk factor for sleep apnea. So if people lose weight, their sleep apnea can go away. So if you're, you know, somebody who, uh, you know, this can be kind of a, a teachable moment for some people. I just realized I have sleep apnea and I really want to start taking care of my health and my life overall. So, you know, I'm going to lose weight and uh, this will go away. So, so it may be the first red flag for someone who is battling weight to recognize that this is doing damage to them. This is, this is affecting them. Correct. Yeah, and, and again, uh, it's like having, let's say, high cholesterol. I mean, it can cause problems down the road, but sleep apnea also impacts how you feel on a day-to-day -day right basis now. and how you perform. Yeah. So losing weight is one treatment. Uh, there are some people who their sleep apnea really comes out when they drink alcohol before they go to bed, for example. So uh, again, we have people who are drinking probably a little bit too much, and if we can get them to cut back on the alcohol, sleep apnea goes away. That's fabulous. Yeah, so I think there are kind of other health behaviors that can kind of help. Okay, and then um, this is the way all of medicine is, right? We try education and, right. and we try some modification of behavior in the environment, and then we start going to doctor stuff, right. <laughs> which is tr more traditional doctor stuff. Are there drugs? Uh, a traditional doctor treatment? Right. I wish that there were, and a lot of the research that I do is to try and find medications that would work for the treatment of sleep apnea. and. We can maybe talk more about this down the road, but as of you know, 2015, there's not a drug, there's no pill for sleep apnea. Okay. And so the main treatment is a device which is called CPAP, and that's uh, CPAP, or Continuous Positive Airway Pressure. And many patients know it as the mask. So this is a device that people wear every night when they go to sleep. It's a mask over the nose, or nose and mouth, and it pushes air into the patient's airway. And when it pushes air into the patient's airway, mm -hmm. it stops it from collapsing. Right, so if the airway is sort of supposed to be a, an open tube and it's collapsing, this just pushes air pressure to hold, it's a, it's a pneumatic splint to hold the airway open. And then patients breathe the way they normally would breathe in and out. It sounds sexy. It's incredibly, there's a lot of sex appeal with this. <laughs> yeah, I mean. But, but I do want to say that uh, patient spouses actually appreciate CPAP. There's good data that you can improve the quality of life of the question bed partner to you. Yes. Uh, if you can get rid of the, uh, the snoring and the gagging and gasping that happens. So, so for the, it's a funny question, but for the sleep partner, mm -hmm. does their sleep improve when their partner's sleep improves on CPAP? Yes, on average, it, it does improve. So. There are people that say, oh, that machine really bothers me for whatever reason. But most people, the machines are very quiet. It's quieter than whatever their bed partner was doing when Before. they couldn't breathe. Right. People, when they have sleep apnea, are often very restless sleepers because they can't find a position where they can sort of sleep and breathe at the same time. Um, so yeah, their sleep quality gets better for the bed partners too.
That's that's neat. Yeah. Uh, that's a positive, right? There, there's also a lot of worry. You know, people really bed partners worry. Are is my bed partner going to start breathing again? You know, right. and, and people there are husbands and wives who sort of keep no, elbowing. Yeah, to get which, which means you're not getting good sleep either. Right. So, so people are very anxious about these right. things. Um, Doctors love, uh, you know, uh, I'm a surgeon, and did, mm -hmm. is there an operation for sleep apnea? Yeah, I, I do want to be clear that, you know, CPAP, the mask has several advantages. Um, it's not an operation, it works right away if you can tolerate it. So that's really the, the gold standard. And for a number of reasons, we have a lot of good data that, you know, if you use CPAP, your chance, of, your blood pressure can get better, your risk of arrhythmias can get better. Right, and, and we can be clear, I mean, if, if surgery was the only way to fix this and somebody invented CPAP, it would be, you know, Nobel Prize territory. Yeah, again, exactly. Right? So, so we have it, we take it for granted that it exists, right. and it's fabulous, um, and, and I understand that. From my point that. of view, yeah. Yeah, no, no, I but, mean, it's, it works. Yeah. You have, you have a successful treatment. Right, but the, uh, there are many different kinds of surgery, and in general, the surgeries work by removing extra tissue or trying to get that airway to be a little bit bigger. And so, uh, for example, the most common procedure is, well, it's called a U-triple-P or uvulopalatal pharyngeoplasty, and that just means that you're gonna cut out the tonsils, you're gonna cut out the soft palate, you're gonna cut out the uvula thing that hangs down the back of the throat. To make space. To make space. And there's a, a variety of procedures kind of like that, some of them get really involved moving the jaw forward, all sorts of things. But, um, but for the right patient, that can be a good solution. You mentioned moving the jaw forward. Are there just appliances that people can wear to do that alone without CPAP? Yes, so there are, uh, they have different names, either oral appliances or mandibular advancement device, but this is sort of like a retainer device that people put in their mouth at night, and it, it brings the lower jaw forward, and the idea is that bring the lower jaw forward, bring the tongue forward, create more space. So. That's kind of where we've been, and now there's some newer things that are that are taking place. Um, and I, I, I was preparing for the show, yeah. and I love this because it gets to update me as well as an ophthalmologist. Yeah. The, 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 there are pacemaker-like devices that you're putting in different places to help out. Tell us about yeah. that. Yeah, that's the, they're called hypoglossal nerve stimulators, and they're in a, a really exciting part of our field. And the idea is similar to a cardiac pacemaker. So. Uh, for a cardiac pacemaker, you, you put a small device underneath the skin in the chest, and if it needs to, it, it sends a little electric charge to the heart. This is a little bit different. Still is a box that's underneath the skin, and there's an electrode that goes to the tongue nerve. And when it needs to, uh, when it senses that you're breathing, it sends an electric shock to the tongue, the tongue moves forward and gets out of the way so that people can breathe. Wow. Yeah, it, I mean, it's... It's really amazing, um, it works pretty well, but we haven't quite figured out in whom it's going to work 100% of the time. But for some people, you know, they swear by it, but they have to go uh, around the airport line, you know. Oh, it right, turns. because it'll, it'll, it'll buzz as they go through. Right, right. Uh, so we're sort of still learning the right patient for this, but definitely uh, we have some interest in this. You know, they're, it's FDA approved, um, and Actually, UCSD doesn't right now have a surgeon that's doing it, but there are, uh, we're looking to do that and start to expand the program here. And that's exciting. And, and I'm not sure if this is correct, because I'm you know, Googling around looking to make sure I, I, I see this, but there are a significant number of people who start on CPAP that don't always continue on it. Yeah, it, there are many CPAP machines that are in people's closets not being used. And we have, I think we, meaning the medical profession, has really recognized that for some people, they're going to have trouble with CPAP therapy. So, so this alternative becomes important. Yeah, very important. Uh, again, I think we realize that giving somebody a CPAP machine and saying, you know, take this goodbye, and right? you know, goodbye, yeah. that doesn't work. And so there are a number of ways that you can improve maybe that 50% number up to maybe 75, 80%. And so, you know, we're very interested in that's how we practice medicine here is to really try to get people through that hump when they're on CPAP. But you're right, there are many people who we would really need another treatment option for their sleep apnea. And being able to offer them this, combine it with lifestyle changes if that's necessary. Yeah. Uh, now you have somebody who is, is turning a corner and going in the right direction. Absolutely, and you know, I think many times when patients don't listen to what we tell them to do, you know, it does happen. Um, yeah, I think sometimes patients feel bad about that and they feel like they're failing. And I think, you know, we recognize that CPAP is not an ideal treatment from a patient's perspective. And so um, I like the fact that I can offer something else to them. You know, and it's not, it's not that they, you know, didn't try hard enough with their CPAP. It's really not for them. 
So and we need to find a better solution. Sure, not, not, it's not one size fits all. Absolutely. So, so science fiction me for, for a couple of minutes now. Yeah. What's coming next and where would you like to see it go? What, what are people looking for um, to, going forward? Yeah, so uh, a lot of the research that I do looks at why different people have sleep apnea. And we're sort of recognizing that sleep apnea is not just about having kind of a collapsible airway. There are other factors that are important. Some of those might be how effective your muscles are at pushing the tongue forward, how stable your control of breathing is at night, uh, and also how deeply you can sleep or how easy you wake up. And so we have sort of worked at developing a test to measure these traits in people while they're sleeping. And so in the future, what I think you would do is you'd come into the sleep lab, we'd find out why you have sleep apnea, and then we would target a therapy to why you have sleep apnea as opposed to this one-size-fits-all approach of CPAP. Yeah, the precision medicine exactly. era that we're all entering. Yeah, so I, I think we're actually not that far away from it. You asked me a little bit, are there medications for sleep apnea? Um, we found a group of patients that wake up too easily. So as soon as their airway collapses a little bit, they wake up. And we were able to give them basically a, a sleeping pill, like, a, like Ambien or something you may have heard of on TV, and their sleep apnea gets better. So, you know, this is what we're trying to do, uh, and we have a lot of work to do, but I, I don't think it's that far from the future right now. So somebody's sitting at home, mm -hmm. uh, they, they've watched the show intently, and they think maybe it's them, that maybe they do really have sleep apnea. Tell them what they should do right now. Well, again, I think if you can get a little bit more information, um, you know, based on a bed partner. Uh, we have people come in, they do all sorts of funny things, but it's really helpful to us. They, they record themselves on their iPhone, uh, you know, and they, here's the sounds I make, and we say, oh, geez, that sounds kind of concerning. Um, but, but short of that, you know, most primary care physicians are very up on this and can provide some guidance, or you could come right to our clinic, I think, as well. And the primary care physician can prescribe a CPAP machine? They would either refer them to a sleep specialist that they know and trust and work with, they uh, can also order some of the sleep testing. You have to have a sleep test. Before uh, you can. Yeah, so unfortunately, even if we have people that we know that they have sleep apnea or you know, very, very strongly suspect, you have to go through the sleep study first. And that seems fair in case there's something else that's going on. Correct, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, the time goes quickly, and this has been a fabulous discussion. Thank you for taking the time oh, thank you. to enlighten us. I think this is going to be fabulous, and I'm sure there are going to be people at 2 in the morning who flip on the <laughs> station who are having trouble sleeping and they recognize themselves in this, or, or spouses that notice something's not quite right with the breathing of their partner. We, we would love to see them in the clinic. That would be yeah, great. Uh, that's fabulous. Thank you so much. I've been speaking with Robert Owens uh, here from UC San Diego about sleep apnea, and this is a big deal. You're talking about 50 million people out there, and, and that, that means it, it may be you, uh, or it may be your, one of your loved ones. Pay attention to this. It can really affect your mood. If you know someone's mood or they're, they're, they're irritable, think about these kinds of issues that may be a part of what's going on. That's where your primary care doctor makes a big difference, and you can start there. I'm Dr. David Granite. Remember, knowledge is power, and we'll see you again next time right here on Health Matters.